who doesn't like a pretty memento, you know, a souvenir? When visiting an exotic place or when on vacation, whether or not we like to go all out with the shopping, a souvenir is something that we almost always like to pick. Sometimes for our friends and relatives, sometimes just a little fridge magnet for ourselves. You know, something to remember the place and the experience by. What if that experience is flying the Air Force One, the official plane of the American president? Now, say you get to ride on the plane, would you like to keep a souvenir of your brush with power? I'm sure you would because it is not every day that you get to board the plane or fly with the US president. Work takes many journalists to the press cabin of the Air Force One. They fly with the US president on his official visits. But aboard the Air Force One, the crew does not hand out fridge magnets or stickers. So how does a White House correspondent remember the flight, if not by a keepsake? Now, over the years, reporters have reportedly found their own sources for souvenirs. Some have allegedly picked up wine glasses. Some have picked up a spoon here or a fork there. Anything as long as it carries the insignia of the Air Force One. Some American correspondents reportedly also managed to fit dinner plates into their backpacks. Many have repeated the drill multiple times as per reports. There are reports of correspondents flashing their conquests at dinner tables, showing off their Air Force One porcelain collection. As per one report, in fact, a former White House correspondent once hosted a dinner where they served food on Air Force One plates, all picked one by one over the course of their career. Anyway, my point is, the Air Force One loot is allegedly an open secret in Washington with veterans reportedly nudging newbies to flick a wine glass for keepsake. It's not unusual to hear the sound of clinking glassware as reporters get off the Air Force One with their carry-on luggage. Quite an irony if you ask me, given how heavily secured the Air Force One is. The White House, we are told, has had enough of this joke. In February, the Air Force One crew reportedly notified the White House travel official of items missing from its inventory. And soon an email went out from the White House Correspondents Association to its members. The text was clear. The missing items from the Air Force One press cabin have not gone unnoticed. If you are one of those who did happen to take something off the plane by mistake, we can help you return it. One correspondent did take up the offer. Reports talk about a secret meeting that was arranged between the correspondent and a government official. At a park near the White House, the correspondent returned an embroidered pillowcase. This was an exception. No one else really responded to the email or acted on the association's request. Now, for a journalist, a ride on the Air Force One is not free. Media outlets have to pay for their reporters to fly the Air Force One. The bill is inclusive of in-flight meals and drinks. The publication that first reported this story wrote, and I quote, For years, scores of journalists and others have quietly stuffed everything from engraved whiskey tumblers to wine glasses to pretty much anything with the Air Force One insignia on on it into their bag before stepping off the plane. But why just blame reporters alone? There are reports of senators picking or taking home items from Air Force One. In the year 2012, actor Alison Williams spoke about how her dad once picked an item from the Air Force One and how she used that item to impress a boy. You see, that's where the story lies. People like to impress the others by showing off the fact that they have had the chance to board a plane whose ticket money cannot really buy you. Souvenirs help them in their mission to impress. Sure, the US Air Force has a site where it sells Air Force One mementos, but these souvenirs are nothing like the items used on board the presidential plane. Remarks made by the U.S. Ambassador to India, Eric Garcetti, have been dominating headlines. The comments were made during an interview to news agency ANI. What did he say? 
Let's get you all the details. Now, as part of a wide-ranging interview, the ambassador spoke about his journey, the U.S.-India relationship, also his commitment towards boosting those ties, among other aspects. Referring to the investigation of the alleged failed assassination plot against Khalistani terrorist Gurpatwan Singh Pano, the ambassador said that no government or its employee can be involved in the alleged assassination of another country's citizen, which is just an unacceptable red line, quote unquote. Any country mm. having an active member of their government involved in a second country trying Just, to assassinate okay. one of their citizens. That's, I think, usually a red line for any country. That's mm -hmm. a basic issue of sovereignty. That's a basic issue of rights. Now, in case you weren't aware already, India has designated Gurpatwan Singh Panu as a terrorist. He enjoys dual citizenship in America and Canada. India and the U.S. are working together in the investigation of the alleged foiled assassination plot against the Khalistani terrorist. Panu has repeatedly issued threats against India, in fact. Basically, he has openly issued multiple threats to India related to attacks on the Indian parliament, Air India. So what about these threats? What did the ambassador have to say about them? Referring to the threats issued by Gurpatwan Singh Panu, Eric Garcetti said that the American system protects free speech, quote-unquote, for better or for worse. He also made it clear that an American citizen can be convicted or deported only according to the country's laws. Our law for an American citizen to be convicted in an American court or to be deported to have um, a, a criminal case in another country, it has to meet our law. And so we'll continue working, and if anybody ever says something that steps over that line, and I know it's gotten very close, we will be working together on that. Now the thing is, Panu's threats have caused a lot of concern, not just in India, but also among the members of the Indian American community. Just for context, you remember how we told you recently uh, that some members of the Indian American community held a special meeting in America? They met with representatives from the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the Department of Justice and the police. Members of the Indian American community told the U.S. authorities that American soil is being used for terror activities against India. They also spoke about the rise of the Khalistani movement in the U.S., which of course has been a major concern. Now, following the remarks made by the U.S. ambassador to India in the latest, re reacting to the remarks made by the ambassador regarding the quote-unquote red line, India's external affairs minister, Dr. S. Jay Shankar, has said that the U.S. Amb ambassador, as an ambassador, will say what he thinks is the position of his government. The U.S. ambassador, uh, as an ambassador, obviously will say what he thinks uh, is, the, you know, the thinking of his government or the position of his government. I will say what is the position of my government. And the position of my government is that in this particular case, there have been certain information which has been provided to us, which we are investigating. Uh, and it is something we are investigating because we believe our own national security interests are involved in that investigation. So as and when we have something to say on that investigation, we would be very glad to speak about it. So there you have it. India has made its position absolutely clear and we will be keeping a close eye on how things pan out. When a clothing item says one size fits all, it is supposed to fit all, all the bodies, small and big, slender and curvy. But this one brand misunderstood the message, it seems. I'm talking about Brandy Melville, a fashion chain run by a secretive Italian family. It makes stylish and affordable basics that are sold mainly in one size. It's like the retailer wants to make a club of mean girls, only at a much bigger level. Skinny, mostly blonde girls fill its social media feeds and even staff its stores. Unlike most other brands, it's not capitalizing on inclusivity, but rather exclusivity. Not everyone can wear the clothes, and that's only fueling the obsession around it. The problem is the brand is particularly famous among teenagers and prepubescents. 
And the common perception is if you can fit into a Brandy Melville, you are part of an elite club. You have good style and are popular and people want to be your friend. But you cannot enter that club until you look a certain way. Imagine being a young and impressionable teenager, thinking there's something wrong with you simply because you cannot fit into a particular brand's clothes. What makes us say that? There are customer accounts, and by customers, I mean girls who are merely 12 to 18 years old. Some of them have shared how they wanted to lose weight so that they could squeeze into a Brandy Melville. A few have even developed eating disorders. And it does not even stop at customers. As per reports, the retailer pushes for the same elite club while hiring as well. Job seekers reportedly are assessed partly on their looks. They are asked to pose for photos that are shared with managers, allegedly. This is not a model agency that we are talking about. It's simply a clothing shop. A former employee and a group of licensees have even filed lawsuits against the brand. The ex-employee claims that he was let go of because he refused to fire female employees who did not look like typical white teenage girls. Canadian licensees allege that their license was terminated after they refused to shut two stores that did not reflect the Brandy Melville image. These stores either catered to ethnic minorities or were staffed by a manager who was short and fat, quote unquote, according to the complaint. This is infuriating to say the least. Here's a brand that is apparently fostering negative body images among young girls, the same girls who are already vulnerable to societal pressures about their appearance. But you know what the saddest part is? That the allegations of discrimination have done little to lessen the brand's appeal. Many still want to be a part of the club because they like the chic clothes that are also affordable. Some have even questioned why it's okay to have plus-sized brands, but not petite-sized. Now, plus and petite should not be at odds, of course. They should not be pitted against each other. If anything, the, a brand must respect all body sizes instead of creating divisions. And most importantly, as a customer, one should buy clothes that are made for your body instead of molding your body to fit into specific clothes.